Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you're challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and are looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. Happy Easter, church. Easter. Jesus is risen. risen Do you realize what you're saying when you say that? That's so incredible. That means that that Jesus has victory over death. Amen? Amen. That Jesus has victory over sin. Amen? Amen? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and you can have that victory, and you can have life too. Amen? Today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up a series we've been doing, going through the Gospel of John, looking at the seven great I Am statements, where Jesus is declaring himself to be God, and then telling you something about what it means for him to be God through these statements. Today we're going to look at that he is the resurrection and the life, not just an event that happened 2,000 years ago, not just something that will happen for those that are followers of him, but that he is the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? Don't answer yet. It's a dangerous question. Let me pray for us, and we'll open up to John chapter 11. Father, I pray today for every person that's gathered in your name, in this room, online, at churches around the triangle, around the country, around the world, celebrating something that you did 2,000 years ago that's still relevant to us in this very moment. God, you are an amazing God. Thank you for being so powerful, so sovereign, so good, so gracious, so kind, so forgiving, so loving, so just, so righteous. Father, you are more than we could say in any one service. But I pray as I open up your word today and share with people here that your son will be glorified, and I pray you do something miraculous in this room. I pray that there be people that are in bondage that would be set free. I pray that there would be people that, that don't know you as Savior, uh, that are either watching online or in this room that would come to know you. I pray that there would be hearts that would rejoice and that have gotten apathetic, that would be set on fire for you. Bring revival. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we get started in John chapter 11, let me start with a simple question for you today. What's the most dangerous decision you've ever made? What's the most dangerous thing that you've ever done? And you can think through your whole life. Think about when you were a kid, maybe as a little boy or a little girl. Did you ever jump your bike over something like a sibling? Ever jump off of something, maybe the roof of your house or a tree or something like that? And by the way, kid, I see there's some young people in here right now. I'm not trying to give you ideas for lunchtime when the adults are all talking. But there's things that we've done, right? Like I was thinking of my own life this week as I was reflecting on this about times when I've done things that were dangerous. I remember when I was a little boy at my house in Michigan, we had a basement in our house, and my mom must have lost one of those hairpins, bobby pins we used to call them. I don't know what they were, but there's a little, little pin on the ground. And I picked it up, and I looked at it, and I thought, that would fit nicely in those two slots on the wall over there, known as an outlet. But I, I must have known it was wrong, because I remember, like, as I was doing it, kind of looking around, like, is anybody going to see this? Like, someone would tell me not to, even in a, as a child, I knew this was not a good idea. And I stuck in, and it was not a good idea, okay? I ended up on my butt. I stuck it in the thing, not good. <laughs> but not the most dangerous I've ever done. <laughs> How about you? What's your dangerous decisions? Have you ever taken a risk, maybe a career risk or a financial risk? I remember when we came to plant this church. Uh, we had just had a baby. Let me tell you something. We didn't know if anyone would show up. And when you go to plant a church, they don't have like a health care plan for you. <laughs> they don't even know if any people are going to be there. I didn't know if anybody would care about a church that wasn't about a denomination or tradition. And we hadn't lived in this community before. We just wanted to, it's, it's written on the wall out there. We wanted to connect people to Jesus for life change. And God's been doing that ever since. It's incredible. But what if it hadn't happened? So maybe I had to get another job. That's not that big of a risk. And so what are, what are some risks? And I was thinking about a conversation I had with my wife this, this past week. We were talking, and there's some trees in my backyard that I wanted to take down. They're not big trees, about four or five inches around. And I have a chainsaw. Those of you who don't like that idea, I do own one. And I do have a ladder. And I came up with this idea, but I thought I should probably run it by another adult before I tried it. And so I said, Shan, what do you think if I were to take a ladder and lean it up against that tree and I could chop off the top part and then I'll bring the ladder down a little bit and I'll chop off the next part and I'll bring it down. Eventually I chop the whole tree down. Do you know what she said? No! Just a one word response. You are not doing that. No! Then my 13 year old daughter, Ava, came into the room and said, Dad, are you short on sermon illustrations? Why would you do that? 
I said, no, it's not about sermon illustration. I don't want, I want, I don't want these trees in our backyard. I don't want to pay somebody to take it down. I think I can do it. And then she said to me, I love it when my 13-year-old has more wisdom than I do. She said, Dad, if you do this and something goes wrong, no one will ever listen to you again about making good decisions. Well, that's a good point. Decision's still pending, just so you know, but I haven't done it yet. What's the most dangerous decision you've ever made? As I reflected on it, that wasn't it either. See, the decisions I thought through immediately were ones that maybe I'd lose my life. Maybe, maybe dismemberment, right? Cutting the tree down. Maybe I'd lose some money. There's been financial risk. There's been physical risk. But by far, the most dangerous decision I've ever made had to do with Jesus. What about you? Because if what the Bible says about Jesus is true, and you don't follow him, that's not just life and death, that's eternity. But if what the Bible says is not true, and you do follow him, do you know that the Bible actually says that you're to be most pitied, that you lived a Christian life, believing in the resurrection, professing the resurrection, if it's not true? Because that means that one day you're going to stand before God, and you proclaim things about him that aren't true. And so you're going to be judged for that. That's a dangerous decision. And today I'm going to ask you one question multiple times throughout the message. And it's a dangerous question. I don't want you to answer it verbally right now. But the question is simply this. Do you believe this? It's a question Jesus asked in the passage we're going to look at today. It's in John chapter 11. And there's 53 verses in the passage we're going to look at. We're not going to go through each one of them uh, individually. But we're going to focus in on a statement that Jesus makes when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not I will be, not I was, but I am the resurrection and the life. We've been doing this series looking at these great I am statements of Jesus. There's seven of them in the Gospel of John. And one of the things that we've learned is that when Jesus does a miracle in John, it's not about the miracle, it's about the message. The miracle points to the message. In fact, John doesn't even call them miracles, he calls them signs. And, and we all know here, just from our life experiences, that signs are not the destination. I know many of you went on spring break this past week. I saw your pictures on social media. You're in different places, you know, Carolina Beach and Florida and up in the mountains and different things. I didn't see a single person take a picture at a sign that said, Carolina Beach, 25 miles away, with them in their, their chair, you know, their Bah Tommy Bahama chair, and their sandals, their feet in the gravel, thinking they were at Carolina Beach. Because, you know, the sign is not the destination. The sign only points to the destination. And so, so far in the Gospel of John, we've seen things like Jesus feeds 5,000 people with a Lunchable. Pretty amazing, but not the point. The point is, he says, I am the bread of life. And he's saying, I am your source of satisfaction. If that's not true, then your only hope for finding satisfaction is in this world, and that's empty. But Jesus opens the eyes of a man who was born blind, so his whole life, he's only known darkness. And then he says, I am the light of the world. If Jesus is not the light of the world, then you are lost in your sin and in darkness. Jesus says in this passage, Maybe the most important, certainly the most powerful. I am the resurrection and the life. Meaning, apart from me, there's no real life, no spiritual life. Look at what he says. We'll start reading in verse 17 uh, for the sake of time. What's happened, he's got this family he's close with, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and Lazarus has died. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. That's significant. We'll talk about what four days means in a little bit. Uh, Bethany, not a person, it's a place. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <laughs> I don't know if you know John chapter 11, but she had no idea he meant in about 10 minutes. Martha gives an answer that any Orthodox Jew would have given, that many people in churches across America and the world would give today. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, not I will be, not I was. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then this dangerous question, 
do you believe this? And so here we have a situation. Four days. We'll talk about what that means in just a minute. But four days, he's been in the tomb. Jesus shows up. Martha says the question. Mary says the same thing a little bit later. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen, usually when people start a sentence with if, it's followed by a regret. If I had just listened to my parents. If I had just done a different thing. If I had gone a little bit sooner, if I wouldn't have, if I had taken that call, if I'd have said those words, if I wouldn't have said those words, and it's usually followed by some of the biggest regrets in our lives. Martha here wishes that Jesus had shown up sooner. If you had been here. In other words, let me paraphrase that for you. There was a time when you could have worked, but that time has passed, Jesus. Have you ever been there? And then Jesus responds with, I am the resurrection and the life. He's going to rise again. She has no idea exactly what he's really talking about. And then he unpacks what that means. But he asks this dangerous question. The question I ask you, do you believe this? And I want to ask you three questions today in place of points. And the three questions are going to lead us to the answer of whether we really believe this. The first question is simply this. Do you believe that Jesus can do the impossible. Not just will or has, that he can today, right now, in whatever situations are going on in your life, that Jesus can do the impossible. He actually makes a difference today, not just 2,000 years ago, not just someday, but he makes a difference today, regardless of the situation. And how you answer that question leads you to the answer of, do you believe this? Do you really believe that he is the resurrection? Because we've all faced impossible situations. In fact, we, it's why we're so drawn into them in the movies. You ever watch a movie where there's a situation that's so impossible and then you're like cheering for them to get through or out of the impossible situation? Last Sunday after church, I was laying on the couch just flipping through the channels. One of my daughters, Janie, was in the room with me and we're, we're watching TV and I'm looking for something I can watch while she's in there, but I'm kind of exhausted and it's like the sports were lame and didn't want to watch that. And so I was going through like, you know, TNT and Lifetime, those channels, they always have the same movies. They were playing an old version of Mission Impossible. Do you all remember the Mission Impossible? For those, I just assume a lot of people have seen it. Um, maybe you don't watch movies because you're a Christian. We're glad you're here today. Thank you. Um, but the old Mission Impossible where Tom Cruise had to sneak into the, the CIA headquarters in Langley. Yep, a couple of you are nodding your head. All right, all right, I'm not alone. That feels good. And, and what happens is they, they disguise themselves as firemen and firewomen, which I don't know if I was just being cynical this past Sunday. Maybe something happened. Somebody said something to me after church. I don't know what happened. But I, I remember thinking, how'd they get a fire truck? I didn't think that the first time I watched it. And I was watching, I'm like, I've never been to Avis or Budget or Enterprise. And they say, would you like the fire truck, Mr. Lear? No, this is never, where do you rent a fire truck? And so they drive up in this antique fire truck, by the way. They got firemen uniforms. They sneak into Langley. They ditch the uniforms. They climb through the air vents. And there's two guys, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, the main character, and then another guy who's up there with him in the air vents. And they do this pulley system to lower them into this room that has all these alarms on it. Listen to these alarms. If you touch the floor, the alarm goes off. If you make too much noise, the alarm goes off. If the temperature raises more than one degree, the alarm goes off. However, oversight, if you turn the computer on, the alarm doesn't go off. <laughs> it's crazy. And so they're lowering through this vent, and then this rat comes, and the guy who's lowering the thing has to let go of the cable, and then Ethan's whoop, like he falls like inches from the floor, and he's hanging there doing the Tom Cruise thing. And if he touches the floor, you know, the alarm goes off and he starts to sweat, and then he catches it. Now, I've seen the movie before, and I'm cheering, catch the sweat, like I'm wanting it to happen. I'm watching my daughter who hasn't seen it before watch it, and they get the information off the computer. They drive away in their antique fire engine. I don't know why they did that, but whatever, they're driving away. That wouldn't happen. If you're thinking about breaking in CIA headquarters, let me give you pastoral advice, don't. But why are we cheering for him to get out? Why do we do that? Why is it some of you, and you might not want to admit this at church, you cheer for bad guys in movies to get out of impossible situations. I've done it too. I understand. It's because we've all been in impossible situations. And we wish we had control. And we wish we could do something about it. And sometimes the impossible situation is you want your kids to love Jesus and they don't. And you wish you could do something about it, but you can't. Sometimes the impossible situation is you wish you could have a baby and you can't. And you tried the medications and you've done the procedures and you've prayed. And it's not happening and it's, it's, it's impossible or you need a healing, or you want to reconcile a marriage, or you want to, and I could go on and on about the, we've all had them. Everyone in this room has had an impossible situation. That's where we're at in this passage. In fact, I didn't read the first 16 verses, but it's interesting. If you read the beginning, John's being very clear to make sure he says, in spite of these circumstances, Jesus loved these people. 
In fact, when the messenger sent the two sisters, Mary and Martha, while Lazarus is sick, send the messenger and says, they don't even ask Jesus to come heal him. They say, the one whom you love is sick. And so we just know because you love him that you're going to show up. That's not what he does. Go back in the passage if you've got a Bible and look. And look at verse 4. It says, but when Jesus heard... He said, this illness does not lead to death. Well, wait, we already read verse 17. When Jesus shows up, the guy's been dead for four days. Is Jesus wrong? He said, it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus, and he's emphasizing this again, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then the next word in verse 6, every word in the Bible matters. But if you don't get the next word, you will not understand John chapter 11 fully. Verse 6 does not say, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, but it does not say he loved Jesus, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. However, it says so, so. Some of your translations, therefore, because, because he loved them. Look at what he did. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. What? That doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't he go and fix this? That's why in verse 17, we start reading, he's been in the tomb for four days. That's why Martha says, if you had been here, if you had just shown up, my biggest regret, that you didn't come sooner, he'd be alive. If you understand the time frame, it takes some of the sting out of the passage but it doesn't change what Jesus was doing. Well, Jesus only waited where he was at two days. In verse 17, we already saw that Lazarus had been dead for four days. How does this happen? Well, what happens is that Mary and Martha give this messenger this information, the one whom you love is sick, and they send the messenger on his way. Lazarus must have died as soon as the messenger left. So he travels. It takes one day to travel from where they're at to where Jesus is at. Jesus waits two days. Then Jesus travels to where they're at four days, which means when Jesus received that information, one day of travel, Lazarus has already been dead. And so even if he rushes and goes there, he's already dead. But Jesus intentionally, why did he wait two days? It's because four days is significant. Here's why four days is significant, because Jews believed, I'm not saying Jesus believed, I'm not saying I believe, but Jews believed in that time, based on their observations of people dying, that when somebody died for three days, their soul or their spirit hovered around their body because they didn't have all the medical technology we have and they didn't have the embalming process that we have. And so they had times where they were taking people out in caskets to be buried and they were alive. And so they believed that after, for three days that the spirit or soul would hover around the body and then try to re-enter the body. But on day four, they'd lose all their color and their body would begin to decompose. So on day four, it's now impossible. So Jesus intentionally waits and tells it's an impossible situation before he arrives on the scene. And here's a truth for some of you that are going through some stuff. God will oftentimes wait for an impossible situation to set himself up for glorification. God will oftentimes wait until your situation is hopeless to put his power on display. One of my favorite examples of resurrection power shows that exact same thing in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God tells his prophet in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, go and prophesy over dry, dead bones. I don't know if you've read that passage. If you haven't read that passage, read it today. Let me tell you, the the historical context for that is that Israel is believing three promises of God. Land, seed, and blessing. God promised a land, he promised seed, and he promised a blessing. The land is the promised land they're going to dwell in. The seed is a king. The blessing is that they would have a temple that God's glory would dwell and the people could gather in. Here's their actual circumstances. Their circumstances are they're in exile, they don't have a land. There is no king. The temple's been destroyed. And so when they look at their circumstances and they look at the Bible, it looks like the Bible's not true. Never been there? Might not want to admit it at church, but I think most of us have. When you look at the circumstance, it might look like there was a time when God could work, but that time has passed. And what happens is that God says to Ezekiel, as he takes them out to these dry bones, he says, can these bones live? And do you know what Ezekiel says back? It's a great answer. He doesn't say, you can do the impossible, God. Do you know what he says? Something you and I should say more often. God, only you know. Only you know. Sometimes he heals, sometimes he doesn't. 
Sometimes he resurrects, sometimes he doesn't. Only you know, God. And then God says to him, you prophesy over these bones. And these bones, they don't have any skin on them. They don't have any tendons on them. They've been slaughtered. Thousands of people have been slaughtered a long time ago. And if you read the Bible, then it actually says there that God starts to reassemble the bones. The knee bones connected to the hip bones. Probably where they got the song. Ezekiel chapter 37. Got to read it on your own. See if it's in there. Like teasing you to read the Bible, right? And so they read, and he puts the bodies back together. But here's the crazy part of the passage. They don't have any life in them. They're just bodies that have been put back together with skin on them and, and tissues on them and sinew. Like, go, go read through the passage. It's amazing. And then you think about all these bodies reassembled, but no life. And then he says, prophesy to the breath. It's the Hebrew word for life. The only one that can have authority over death is the one who created your life, God. Jesus is proclaiming himself to be God in this passage when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Don't answer yet. And those bones live. Because God let them get to a place where it seemed like it was an impossible situation to set himself up for glorification. That's why he tells people like Gideon, your army's too big because he wants to be clear that he's the one who did the work. And so my question for you today when I ask you if you believe that he is the resurrection and life is do you believe that he is that now? Not just do you believe the tomb was empty 2,000 years ago. I bet most of the people gathered in this room, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, believe that was historically true. There's so many facts to back it up. Eyewitnesses accounts, all kinds of other evidence with this. I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is do you believe he is the resurrection today? And I could tell you story after story in our church where we've seen his resurrection power. The Apostle Paul prays in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know the power of your resurrection. Do you, do you, do you want to know it today in your life, in this situation? There's a story that happened just this past week. It, it was a woman in our church, her name is Kay Springs. She's a great godly woman. She's been involved in small groups and celebrate recovery, various ministries in our church over the years. She, in fact, she was on a trip with me um, in Israel. We were doing a tour trip when the whole world shut down uh, back in March of 2020. When we came back, she's had uh, a difficult time. She fell and broke both of her elbows. Um, she's an older lady, and she got COVID, recovered from that. Then about three weeks ago, I got a text message from her daughter, who's back um, from the mission field, who's uh, battling cancer. Uh, texted me and said, and I'll just read it to you. Got my phone up here. Hopeful that none of you all call me at 11 o'clock. Should be calling your pastor at 11 o'clock on Sunday. So here's the text message. Hey, Scott, Jenny, EMS is doing CPR on my mom in their living room right now. Please pray. What? What happened? I had no idea at that moment. We then text with her uh, multiple back and forth texts and met them at Rex Hospital. And what I ended up learning was that Randy, who was working home because of the pandemic, Kay's husband, uh, was working in his den. He heard a gurgling sound. He went out into the living room and Kay was sitting in a chair, seemingly lifeless, called 911, uh, started to do CPR on her, did CPR on her for 10 minutes. Uh, the EMTs came. Uh, they did CPR for 30 minutes on her, uh, used a defibrillator on her 11 different times, rushed her to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, only Randy was allowed to go in, uh, not even Jenny or myself uh, were allowed to go in. Oftentimes, if you carry a Bible, they'll let you go anywhere in the hospital, by the way. Uh, but not right now, and uh, not at this moment. And so I'm standing there. They were told us to stay outside. And so the only access I had was Randy text messaging or emailing. And over the next several days, he'd tell me, you know, she was on a ventilator from the moment she got there, um, how things were going. But day seven, day eight, day eight it was, he texted me and um, didn't share this with very many people, but told me all kinds of bad medical stuff. She's on kidney dialysis, uh, her brain's not showing indicators that she's going to recover, um, just the, still on the ventilator, obviously, all kinds of, of difficult blood transfusions and all kinds of things. And he just said, will you pray for us of uh, the timeline and difficult decisions that we need to make? And if you've ever been in that situation, you know exactly what he's talking about. The next day he wrote me and said, she just moved her left arm. The doctors think that she might recover. This past Tuesday, I went to see her. I'm going to tell you what I said to her when I walked in her room. I have never said this to anyone at the hospital before because I don't like to lie to people, okay? I walked in and I said, Kay, you look amazing. No one looks amazing at the hospital, just so you know. She's fully recovered. She's responding. Yeah, for sure. You give the Lord a hand. 
she started responding to commands. They took her out. She's off the ventilator. She was joking with me, very, very interactive with me when we got there. She was uh, showing me pictures. She goes, can you believe what I look like then? And then here's what's happened. And she even told me, she just goes, I had some stuff before I came in here. The doctor said I don't have any symptoms of it now. And I didn't understand all of it. I'm like, it's amazing. I said, you, I'm going to start calling you Kay, Kay Lazarus Springs. And then she said, you can use it in the sermon if you want. And I was like, you are not a sermon illustration. You are a walking sermon, Kay. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's not just something he did 2,000 years ago. He is still powerful today. Do you believe this? Because oftentimes, it seemed like on day eight, there was a time you could help. That time has passed, God. But oftentimes, God lets things get to an impossible place to put his power on display. In fact, think of the Easter story that we celebrate today. The passage we're looking at is not one of the Easter passages. It's at the end of each one of your Gospels. You can find it, and oftentimes it even says resurrection if you're flipping through a Bible to put a little title on it. What's happening, though, think about from John's perspective, who writes this Gospel. His friend has died on a cross. Not just his Savior, not just his Messiah, his friend. He watched him die. Darkness covered the earth, the earth trembled, and the wrath of God is being poured out on Jesus at the cross, and he cries out, it is finished. What do you think that was like? There's a reason they're hiding in a room when Jesus has a resurrected Christ comes to find them, with the doors locked. If you read the story of the resurrection, you'll see there's women that are going to the tomb. Every gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're going to the tomb. None of them are expecting to find an empty tomb, even though Jesus called his shot. I don't know if anybody was watching the games last night, if anybody's a sports fan. One of the things I love about Jesus, he got so much authority and power over death that he said what was going to happen before it happened. Did you watch the Gonzaga game last night? The kid hit that shot, time's going out. I just, I thought, did he call bank? Any basketball players here? Did he call that, he called glass? Jesus, throughout his ministry from the beginning, John chapter 2, destroy this temple, I'll raise it in three days. He's talking about himself. He tells his disciples, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests, the elders, teachers of the law. They're going to kill me. After three days, I'll be raised from the dead. They weren't expecting that because they were so traumatized by the situation. And they get there, and Jesus is risen. Y'all aren't paying attention anymore. Am I going too long? Come on now. Jesus is risen. Do you believe it? He does the impossible. Next question I want to ask you. Are you afraid he'll change your life? Are you afraid that Jesus will change your life? Because I believe after ministering here in North Raleigh for 15 years, it's the number one reason why we make up so many false versions of Jesus. Because we like our lives the way they are and that Jesus of the Bible threatens that. And so we don't want, there's things that we want. We'll add a version of Jesus to our life to take care of eternity. We'll, we'll add a, a version of Jesus to help us get our goals. But we don't want a Jesus who's going to turn our lives upside down. We like a Jesus who rescues in the midst of difficulty. We don't want a Jesus who shows up on the daily. We want a Jesus who's going to fix the problems the way that we ask him to. We don't want a Jesus who's in control and puts us out of control. And so you see what happens here. He asked her, do you believe? She says, yes. And do you know what he does next? The same thing he'll do with you and me. Well, let's see if you believe. Because belief, to really be faith, has to be put in action. And so you see what happens next. We'll jump down to verse 38. It says, then Jesus deeply moved again. And so he weeps. He enters into the pain of the sister Mary. It says, deeply moved again. Came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone that lay against it. And so it's not in the ground like we would think of. It would be in a wall, in a cave. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Let's put your faith into action. You believe that he'll rise from the dead? Roll that stone out of here. Jesus, says, Jesus had the power to roll the stone away himself. He says, you roll away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. <laughs> it's so polite the way that this version of the Bible says it. That's not actually uh, the most direct translation. In fact, I like the King James. We don't usually use the King James because most of us don't talk. We don't speaketh as the King James speaketh. But do you know what the King James says? Does anybody know what the King James says in this verse? Said somebody in the front row said, he stinketh. That's right. If you don't think that's true, we got to put that verse up there. King says, right, he's, been, he's been there for four days. Go backwards a little bit. Martha said, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Now what sister hasn't said that about her brother before? <laughs> he stinketh. All right, maybe you didn't say it. My brother stinks. That's the direct translation. I can't, I'm not going to roll away the stone. He stinks. By this point, his body's beginning to decompose. He stinketh. Not to mention that would also mean for a Jew, if I roll this stone away, it's defilement. Certainly, 
my Jesus wouldn't tell me to do that. Maybe not if you were in control, but he does. He wants the faith in action. And so you know what happens? They roll away the stone. And you know why? Look at verse 40. Verse 40 tells us the answer why. The Bible has the answer. It says, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You know what the Bible says about seeing the glory of God? That that's how we're transformed. That's how he changes us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, that as we behold his glory, we're changed from one degree to the next. Do you know that in America, 65% of Americans claim to be Christians? Do you think that's true? You don't have to answer out loud. I bet most people here would say probably not. No. Most of us would be considered part of that 65%. I don't remember if they asked me or not, but somebody asked somebody. That only 41% actually attend a religious service, whether online or in person. And the Bible says that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, that the way is narrow, that few will travel on it. So I know that 65% is not right. I don't know anybody's heart. I don't know who is following Jesus and who is not for sure. But I know it's not 65%. I don't think it's 41% because I've met a lot of church people and there's a lot of people that believe things in their head that has no impact in their lives. Jesus is saying in this passage, if you believe this, it will change your daily life. If 65% of Americans or 41% or 25% or 10% we're really followers of Jesus. This would be a different country. Our reputation in the public arena would certainly be different because we would do the one simple and radical command to love our neighbors as ourselves. We love ourselves a whole lot. We think Jesus is here for ourselves. But we love our neighbors as ourselves. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for the church. Who wouldn't want to be married to that guy? You see, what will happen, what happens is If we truly believe and follow Jesus, he changes what kind of husband you are. He changes what kind of neighbor you are. He changes what kind of co-worker you are. What kind of co-worker, what kind of employee are you? I'm not asking what's your boss like, who stabbed you in the back. The Bible says, Colossians 3.23, work as if you're working for the Lord, not for men. What if we did that? Like it would really change our life, change everything about our culture, everything about, so there's got to be a small percentage that really answer, do you believe this with a Yes. She believed it. She rolled the stone away. And you know what happens? Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. He comes walking out, strapped in bandages. They pull the bandages off. But then we find out, and I think it gets really revealing why people didn't believe. Because the Bible then says, if you jump down a little bit further, verse 45, many, not all. Isn't that crazy? There's been a guy who's been dead for four days. Everybody knew that he was dead. People knew who he was. And then after four days, he comes walking out of the tomb and it doesn't say everyone believed. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. These are the ones who didn't believe. So what do you think they did? Do you think they said to themselves, maybe this guy's legit? No. Look what they said. So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered the council, that'd be like today's Supreme Court, and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Ah, We don't want that. Not if the next part of this verse is true. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. It'll change our lives. Our place is the temple. Uh, The place for those men was a symbol of their authority, their power, and their prosperity. I don't want Jesus messing with my money. I don't want Jesus messing with my power. I don't want Jesus messing with my reputation. I mean, I'll take somebody that'll come alongside and help me out. But this Jesus is radical. He turns everything upside down. We don't want him. Listen to me. Let me tell you something. You've got to get this statement, especially if you think you're a follower of Jesus, and you might not be, and maybe one day he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. If the Jesus you're following, you're banking on helping you one day, and he doesn't change today, then you're in trouble on judgment day. If the Jesus you're following doesn't change your life now, he's not going to be able to do anything for you at the end of your life, because you're following a false Jesus. Because the Jesus of the Bible, he says, if anyone, that includes you and me, comes after me, wants to follow me, must take up his cross, deny himself, follow me. You save your life, you got to lose your life. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? We don't like that Jesus. But that's the Jesus we're reading about here that says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Third question, do you want Jesus to be your substitute? Do you want Jesus to be your substitute? 
And so they've just said, uh, if we don't stop him, then he's going to, uh, the Romans are going to come and take our place and our power. And look at verse 49. Um, on that council, the high priest is the boss, is essentially what you should read there. It says, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you guys are morons. That's my translation. It's basically what he said, though. Look, you know nothing at all. That's pretty blunt. He must have been from the north or something. He know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people. Not that the whole nation should perish. Now here's the deal. Caiaphas, although he was a priest, was not a religious man, a spiritual man. He was a political man. He was using religion for politics, which we've seen plenty of in our country. And when he said this, he wasn't talking spiritual. He was talking politically. If we want to keep our power, we've got to kill this guy. John then interprets it and tells us this. He says, he did not say this on his own accord. He didn't even know what he was saying. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, not just for the Jews, but also to gather, and this is talking about you and me, into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So when you read the Gospels and you read Jesus is on trial, that's a fake trial. They've already decided death penalty. They haven't even arrested him. They said, we got to kill this guy. He's Israel's most wanted. Now, if you think about what happens here, this council has 70 people on it. One guy, the boss, says, we got to kill this guy. Did no one think to themselves, so your solution to the guy who raises dead people is death? Like, did not anyone think to themselves, like, just weighing pros and cons lists, right? Like, just kind of weighing this out here. What if when we kill him, he comes back? He seems like he's got power over death. I don't want to be the person who put him on the cross if he's coming back. Problem, I was. And so were you. In fact, the Bible tells us it wasn't Caiaphas. And it wasn't Herod. And it wasn't Pilate. In fact, when Pilate's having a conversation with Jesus in his false trial, and Jesus won't answer his questions, he says, don't you know I have authority to kill you or to let you go? And you know what Jesus says? You don't have any authority but what's been given to you from my Father. And Jesus tells us elsewhere, no one takes my life. I lay it down. He was in control. He called the shot. He's been in control the whole time. And you know what the plan was? To be your substitute. How much does someone have to love you to die in your place? Do you want him to be your substitute? I read a story this past week. There was a father in Georgia. I was out fishing with his son. They were on a lake in, in Georgia, in Carroll County, if you want to look it up. His name is Stefan O'Neill, and uh, Stefan and his son Josiah were in this boat together. Josiah's a four-year-old. Josiah fell in the water. Stefan jumped in the water to save his son. Uh, Stefan knows how to swim, threw his son back up onto the boat, but then for some reason decided to swim to the shore rather than to swim back to the boat, and he didn't make it. He drowned. He died. The people that were being interviewed afterwards were not surprised he would sacrifice his life for his son because of how much he loved his kids. In fact, his wife said, the image that I'll always have of him was him on the floor playing with his kids because he was such a great dad. He was a personal trainer. They went to his gym, interviewed people there, and they're like, yeah, I could see him doing that because of the love. Listen, God loved you so much that he sent his son to be a substitute for you because you need a substitute. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. What you deserve because of your sin is separation from God. The gift of God is eternal life. How does that happen? God had an unsolvable problem. He's holy and righteous, and he wanted relationship with you, but you're sinful. He can't have sin in his presence. The problem in our hearts is we're just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Every one of us worships creation over the creator. So what does he do? He sends his son to become sin for you so that you could become his righteousness. Jesus lived the life that you and I couldn't live, a sinless life, being tempted in every way as we're tempted, but never sinning, dying the death that you and I deserve to die. On the cross, he was absorbing the wrath of God. But in order for that to be effective for you, you've got to believe upon him. The Bible says it like this, and I'm going to read it to you from the Scripture so you know I'm not making it up. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means he's going to change your life, by the way, because he's in control, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Jesus is risen. Jesus. You will be saved. 
For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, made right with God, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are safe. Some of you today need to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and become a true follower of his because you believe that he is, not just was, not will be, he is the resurrection and the life. And so I want to ask everybody who can hear my voice today, whether you're online or you're in this room, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. If you can acknowledge your sin before him and you know that you need a Savior and you answer that last question I asked, do you want him to be your substitute with a yes? Then will you pray and ask him to be your substitute? Will you ask God to, to have Jesus be your Savior, to receive his forgiveness? And I'm going to pray a prayer. Let me tell you what I'm going to pray before I pray it. I'm not tricking you. I'm going to pray a prayer where I'm going to acknowledge sin before God, admit that I'm a sinner. The Bible says we've all done that. That's not a huge admission. But if I believe in my heart that Jesus rose from the dead, I'm asking Jesus then to be my Savior and calling upon Him to be my Lord, meaning I'm giving Him control of my life. If you want to do that, will you pray this prayer with me? Dear God, I admit my sin to you. And you might pray silently in your seat. You might pray out loud. I don't know if you're at Starbucks or you're in a hospital or you're in your living room or you're in this room. But I acknowledge my sin before you. And I need a Savior. And I want Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe he rose from the grave, that he is the resurrection and the life. And I want to receive his forgiveness today. I want to ask Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. If you just prayed that prayer and you're in this room, would you pop your hand up in the air? And if you're watching online, would you text the number that's on your screen right now? And I'm looking around this room. I see somebody raised their hand. Anybody else want to raise their hand? Like you're saying, God, I just prayed that. I want to ask you to be my Savior. And Father, I pray for those who've trusted your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior. We know that all of heaven rejoices when one person places their faith in you. And we're going to celebrate through baptism in just a moment the people who've placed their faith in you want to declare their faith to this faith community. And Father, we rejoice in that. I pray, though, that for those that are believers in you, or those that might think they're believers but have made up a version of you that you'd bring conviction in their heart, but those that are believers, that you'd awaken in their heart a passion for you unlike they've ever had before, no matter where they're at in their walk with you, that they would be on fire for you and love you and be used by you and know the power of your resurrection in their lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.